Welcome everybody. My name is uh, Dino Esposito. I started doing some uh, evangelism work for JetBrains lately. But this presentation here has uh, very little to do with uh, my work at JetBrains, where I mostly focus on Android and, uh, and languages. Uh, uh, but it has instead a lot to do with uh, software architecture. Uh, it took me a few, few moments uh, uh, months ago when I, I was contacted to prepare uh, sessions for this conference about the, you know, the title. And then I ended up with the Copernican revolution of software architecture. Why Copernican? Oh, I, I, like probably many of you, I don't have much memories okay, of history and the rule of Copernicus in the history of mankind. But more or less, for what I can remember, he was basically saying something fairly obvious that nobody could grab or would grab. So trying to paraphrase and try to give a role to, the, to Copernicus into, into, to, to map that into the software architecture, UX first, user experience first, is a uh, well, it's a sort of an obvious way, new obvious way to approach architecture, design of software systems, that for some reasons, not that many people still think about. So, precondition for this talk. So in, in this one, I will just discuss the state of the art as I see things, and forgive me if you think I'm too much big, you know, I have to. High, high, too high reputation of myself, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but it's, it's my vision of software architecture. And probably, okay, I said this sentence, this same sentence for five years at least at conferences, and it was never true. But this time, I, I, I can tell you that just today, I mean, I, I'm coming with uh, the, the concepts that I'm going to present, you will see in the next hour, really, really, really for the very first time, measured against a small part of the real world. So everything that you will uh, hear today works to a good extent, to a large extent, in uh, at least one very large enterprise real world system. Precondition, I told you a moment ago that I probably have a, a too high reputation of myself, and uh, just to mitigate on that point, I have no success stories to tell you. I sure have a failure story. And uh, maybe in the European culture, a success story is much more important than a failure story. But if we look at what happens, what is the common way of doing things and thinking about things, in the other part, beyond the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, the, the United States. There, if you fail, you're great. Because you tried doing something. Maybe you did it wrong, but you tried to do something. If you don't fail, you probably are not visionary enough. You are not that great if you don't fail. And this also reminds me to a concept that I was trying to explain to my mother when I was a student at university. And uh, I was struggling with uh, computer science, uh, well, actually with math exams. And my mom was continuously remembering, oh, your friend got high marks last, last month. The other, remember the other friend you had? Say, mom. It's the failure that makes a man stronger. So I'm happy to be here with my failure story. I had to fight with uh, people, other people in a company that I own for um, a small segment where the failure story comes from. And we are trying to build, however, through some suggestions, ways to understand how to successfully plan some good software today. And for the most part, the thoughts that I'm going to share with you have been shared only in front of a mirror when I shave myself in the morning. Okay, with a customer a couple of weeks ago. 
Yeah, it's a sort of outing, yes. <laughs> okay, you, you, you still have a few moments to leave if you want, <laughs> okay? But if you are still here, let's uh, go back for a moment uh, and look why Why something is different today? Why we, we need to look elsewhere. We need to look beyond the current practices, best or worst or just normal. In the 90s, we had essentially three big assets. Every company had three big assets. One powerful server machine. And everything took place, had to take place on that one single big extremely powerful for the standards server machine. One or maybe two slow computers. But more importantly, we had a huge mass of people, of users, extremely forgiving, extremely passive, humbly accepting any enforcement that developers made on the UI, because the developer was a god. The developers dictate, you, this is how the software work. But how many times, I mean, and, and probably there, there was somebody here that had the same experience. How many times you told it to a customer, the language I'm using does not support the feature you want. <laughs> the language, I said that. And it was maybe, it was the 90s, but I said that because I was using, I don't know, uh, visual, visual C++ board or whatever. And there was no way for me to easily build, the, because I, uh, I had to use ODBC or something to, to make a simple, a stupid, a crude system accessing a database. The language, the framework, does not support the feature you want, so I cannot do that. And people, okay. Okay. So you have to work like that. It's like, say, going, going you know, you, you go to a shop, you get, I don't know, whatever, piece of hardware, media, whatever, and with the rule that you have to use it like this. Because the framework does not support doing simply like this. So, in the end, uh, the, the fundamental thing that has changed in this world in the past 20 years is that we now have in front of us every piece of software we write, even if it's enterprise, even if it's, we, co we call it real world, consumer app, a mobile app, a website, whatever, will face a mass of users which is completely different. And forget about forgiving passive and humbly, humble users. So the assets we have today, some sort of 20 years later, we have a cloud stations, so we have data stored in the air, okay, on a server. Data is still placed on, on some sort of server machine. But it, we, we call it the cloud. Okay, there's something more around the server. It's a server with something around, okay? That you don't explicitly pay for. But it's the same kind of thing. But more importantly, we had now, and that's really different, a myriad of client devices. Now, I'm very, very sensitive on this point on the word device versus the word mobile. I had the last week, there was a, a developer community event in Krakow, Poland. My talk there was uh, mobile is over. This is the new era of devices. The dichotomy mobile versus desktop is over. Mobile what? What is mobile? Instead, we have to start since day one, since just when we start designing any system, thinking of multiple output devices. This is a, not even a requirement. It's not a, a functional or non-functional requirement. It's a must. It's part of the way in which we design the system. So, device-driven, device-oriented, choose the expression you like best. That has to be a point, a strict point, uh, 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 not even a best practice, just a practice. And as a third asset of today, we have a mass of users much less forgiving, and worse yet, we have users who dictate us the UI they want. The world goes like this. 
Six or seven years ago, I was happy. Every day was happy for me. I could go out maybe three times, four times a week playing tennis and still get a lot of money from royalties, articles and book royalties. Now it's different. I have to work. <laughs> so I have to play much less tennis and uh, write more, consult more, study more. The world changes. And uh, users dictating some or in a way, probably several aspects of the user interface, this is another condition, another fact. We have to observe, we have to comply with, uh, and that we cannot change. Let's take another break. Yeah, it's simply a different world. Now, what we have in this uh, different world, why this world is different. Well, I think that overall, I can uh, identify four blocks, four pillars sustaining the world. The amount of data, the shape of data, the format of data, and this is one. Uh, device orientation meant to be the attention that we have to put because our systems, no matter the type of the system, is going to be consumed in a way or the other through a variety of different devices. Augmented reality, augmented UI, uh, meaning that yeah, because of the devices, we need to pay into a lot more care how we organize the UI, how we make the UI usable. We've been a lot too static in this area. Because of, okay, what else came past the drag and drop, past the mouse? The mouse is early 90s, is Windows 3 point something. So 20 and 25 years ago, uh, yeah, it was the mouse. And now, the touch, yeah, okay, but the touch was only a few years ago. So nothing has really happened in this area for too long. And maybe this broad has to be probably to formulate, okay, it's like this, it will, ever be, it will always be like this. So touch is the big change of today. And, but not because, okay, you can touch, because touch is like click. In terms of pure, in pure terms of software, a touch, a simple touch of the finger is like a click, except that the finger is much larger than the, the pixel at the tip of the arrow. But okay, beyond that, touch is not simply touching, but is using several different gestures, pinch, zoom, scroll. And also it has an impact on uh, the interactivity. Because now I want to touch, and depending on how I touch or, or how I move my fingers, there's an action, there's a new a gesture, a okay? new, new library of gestures. But this has an impact on yeah, interactivity, some impact on coding, and especially on navigability. On a tablet, you, you, you navigate like this. On a PC, you probably scroll vertically using the mouse wheel. On, uh, on a smartphone, it depends. You probably want to have as much as possible in the screen with limited scrolling. Or you might, might want to have you know, something to scroll horizontally, but having uh, tab strips put on the edge. So it's, the, the smartphone is different from the tablet, which is different from the desktop. Not to mention the next big thing, large screens, which is a completely different world. So augmented UI is a must, and it's strictly related to device orientation. And this is for the horizontal bar in this uh, in this diagram. But what about the vertical bar? At the bottom, we find the inherent complexity. Now, I have a, a personal theory on complexity we face today. If you look back at the, okay, uh, uh, what I like to call the beginning of computing era, uh, which means when I started in this business, so which means essentially in the early 90s. I graduated in the 1990, and uh, the, the very first significant operating system I worked with was Windows 3.1. Windows 95 came, that was a young developer, junior developer. And, uh, and Java, 
right once run everywhere came 96, 97. So the advent of Java and at the same time internet, and by the way, Java was known to be in the beginning the language of the internet because you could write applets with Java to be hosted in the browser. So something, something completely stupid, but that was, that was it. But anyway, in the mid-90s, that is the time at which something significant happened in the IT industry. More or less, half the industry decided that they had enough of mainframes, and they decided to rewrite their systems, choosing the only reliable platform, sort of cross-platform language and framework of the time, Java. The other half, or whatever, stayed with uh, the current, the status quo. Mainframes in the back, something colorful and nice at the top. So Windows and mainframe. This dichotomy brought companies who went for the Java branch and developers acting in that area to face a lot of complexity right away. Because companies who opted for Java in the 90s were companies who rebuilt completely from scratch their back end. Okay, as complex as it was in the 90s, but we're still talking about processes, databases, data storage, logic, business logic for running business. In the pre-internet era, but still business, right? So anyway, Java devs were swamped with an amount of complexity much more significant than the complexity that people and developers working for companies who opted for the status quo, so keeping the logical mainframes in Kabul and just building some visual basic forms on top of that, at the face, <clears throat> at the face. That's why today in .NET we are using N hibernate, N unit, N ant, N whatever. And the whatever is something coming from the Java world. There's a reason for that, right? Spring and uh, Hibernate were the, are, are the, the, the most important, most popular tools addressing specific needs, dependency injection on one hand and uh, mapping, the, 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 facing the mismatch between objects and relational stores. And with that, unit testing, profiling, and any sort of tool that can help, could help at the time developers doing their job in a more sustainable, more effective way. At some point, and we are now around the beginning of the 2000s, internet, the explosion of internet. And that was fundamental for companies for one obvious thing. I like having a personal anecdote on this. It was 97, 98, and I was doing a job interview. So I was being interviewed by one of the top managers of the time, Anderson Consulting, now Accenture, one of the biggest, one, one of the, mo the five most important executives of Accenture in Italy. And uh, I was interviewed by him because uh, Still, at the time, I had a, quite a good reputation. And uh, at some point, he, he asked me something like, you know, comment on, what do you think about the internet? I, I was supposed to be, at the time, a C, a C++ guy, you know, a back-end guy. Pfft, HTML, JavaScript, pfft, internet, that's freaking kind of things. I'm a real developer. Yeah? I'm a real man, <laughs> real programmer. <laughs> HTML, <laughs> it's for designer. So, but I had to answer. So I just used a, a few throwaway commands. Well, I really think it's important because it's going to have um, a, a wide impact on, uh, on business. <laughs> Something you know, generic, right? He looked at me and said, you said a big piece of fruit. You're right. Internet 
our vision here at Accenture, uh, okay, well, Anderson Consulting at the time, our vision is um, exactly like this. We will work together very well. We see, we, we, really, we really see that for our customers, internet is gonna be a real breakthrough, making possible things impossible before or highly impractical. Now, I still use this sentence in my books. <laughs> it's a real breakthrough making possible things otherwise impossible or highly impractical. I love that sentence, point one. Point number two, I left six months later. So actually we were, actually me and the company, well, didn't go well, quite well. So no more than six months. Half of which spent trying to get, uh, to get rid of the contract. Now, um, inherent complexity, but the, the, the manager was right, anyway, he was totally right. On the point that internet in 97, 98, when was it? On the impact that internet was gonna have on the way in which companies were expected to, to run business. And, and this is the way in which the inherent complexity point joins becomes important to the other half of the industry who opted a few years before for the status quo. Because now with the internet, companies had a strong reason to revisit their backends, their strategies, their IT organization, because they had now strong business reasons, get new business opportunities. And especially for companies, who still were bound to mainframes, they had two great reasons. Catch new business opportunities, refresh systems, at least 20, 25 years old. Third point, even shops tightly bound to Microsoft and Visual Basic had with .NET a platform that at least was unifying was neutralizing the problem of languages. Guys, you remember, right, that with Visual Basic, there were things impossible to do in Windows, and if you used C or C++, accessing a database for storing or read for a stupid select star from customers, well, was not trivial. So before .NET, there was a, a world, there was a time before .NET, in which the language could affect that functionality you are going to build into the app. .NET changed this. Did a lot of other things, but this is one aspect that .NET changed. So, starting with the 2000, the, the release of .NET essentially, the complexity, the uh, inherent complexity that developers had to face in the .NET and Microsoft space grow up like this. And uh, the drama, the tragedy, is that in a few years, people called to manage this complexity. Managers, project managers, team leaders, were people who grew up putting f buttons on Visual Basic forms with no idea of software design, with no idea of object orientation, with no idea of layers, no idea of software principles. That's why there was a time, not that many years ago, in which all conferences, including Basta, and I had a role in this, had a lot of talks on solid, single responsibility, open close, list of dependency injection, it was a real need in the industry to teach basics again, refresh basic skills to people. Because they needed tools, but you know, basic core tools, education, a new form of education to face the inherent complexity. And today that we are, you know, the, the, the most part, developers are much smarter today than only five or six years ago. Developers have another problem to face, because now everything is software-based, and this is a good thing, because it ensures we can be in this business for the foreseeable future. 
uh, there's another problem coming up. The complexity that affects data. Because for the first phase of the growing complexity, the relational model was good enough to store and retrieve data. The extensive, intensive use of the internet, okay, socials are just uh, the tip of the iceberg, because I think that nobody here, and also outside of here, is gonna build the new Facebook or the new Twitter or whatever. So nobody here is gonna have the serious, problematic, scalability issues that Facebook architects had to face. Uh, I mentioned a project that I work, was, was on, on the, for the first pass a couple of weeks ago. Well, but that system is not certainly going to be a social network, but it still is one of the few projects that really has serious scalability problems because it has to handle an amount of data in the various installations, because it's a customer-based product. In the, in the various installations, it can handle a, a, a quantity of data that in the worst case is 10 times larger than the largest existing systems of today. Larger than for the amount of data being managed of the systems that, that you find in the Heathrow Airport. So, I mean, the, the, the problem of scalability, oh, I need, oh, I need the no SQL because I need scalability. No, you, you may need no SQL, okay, fine, but please, stop on the scalability issue. Scalability is a problem for many applications, but probably not for all possible apps. But still, still, socials told us that a new, completely different architecture, more distributed, more uh, heterogeneous than a plain SQL or Oracle database as possible, and in some cases, strictly required. And this has to do with the fact that because software now is everywhere, and systems must serve the needs of users, the shape of the data we handle not always and not necessarily can be streamlined in the rigid format, in the rigid schema of relational data. That's why document databases, I mentioned RavenDB, but you know, Mongo coached me that there are quite a few of them, start making sense regardless of the scalability needs. So I, I would suggest, you recommend you consider a document database, not because you are, you are the next Facebook. I wish you, you are the next Facebook, but that, that's, that, I mean, I'm sorry, that's not going, going to be the case. But because maybe sometimes a NoSQL, a document database helps managing, sorting, dealing with the data more effectively. Helps representing data in a format that is close to how the user is going to consume that data. And I'm now getting closer and closer and closer to the real point of the presentation, the user and the user experience. So now, amount, shape, and format of data mostly means today relational database management systems. We think we could address effectively device orientation, so the need of having our software, mostly web software, to display through a variety of devices using responsive web design because I'm smart, because I heard some guru who told me, who illuminated me, telling that with responsive web design, you write a single set of web pages and you're done. Magic of CSS media queries, you can have any screen size and it just works. Yes, except, yeah, it's one website, fine, right, totally right, it works on any screen size, right, but it downloads the same amount of data, right. Three megs on a PC, nothing. Three megs on a tablet, acceptable. Three megs on a smartphone, doesn't work. Sometimes works. I mean, responsive web design is a great idea. I mean, it's, it's one of the options you have available. But it cannot be the answer. Like uh, above, 
re relational databases are still a valid option for addressing the amount, shape, and format of data we use today. But it's one option that we have to challenge. So we have a, a couple of fixed, common answers so far that we have to challenge. So the first challenge is, is on RDBMS systems. The second challenge is on responsive web design. The third challenge, augmented UI. Well, it's JavaScript and CSS for, on the web. Outside the web, I, I, I don't know. I think we have no answer. I mean, we have native APIs on uh, uh, iOS and Android, but yeah, we, we're still far from. I mean, I, I will have and we'll discuss in the few moments, that, in moments that to come, concrete options, alternative options for RDBMS and uh, responsive web design. I, I, I'm afraid I don't have an alternative to, to provide for JS and CSS to augment the quality of UI. Inherent complexity, it has to do with modeling. This is another interesting point. Modeling, how would you design? How would, you, how would you implement the business layer? What is the business layer? How many times, I mean, how many times I, I had this answer coming from the audience? And I had no answer. It could be, well, where you deal with data, where you put the logic of the app. But, but what is the logic of the app? It has to do with what? With how you run queries, how you, the, 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 the validation you do before you write a record. But is this business logic? This is, you know, looks to me, database logic, storage logic. And so where is the business? I don't know. Nobody knows. With, because the complexity was never big enough. And when the complexity started being significantly big, reached a critical mass, we had, from nowhere, something called domain-driven design. It, the, the blue book from Eric Evans was published in 2004, I think. Times, coincide beautifully. .NET 2002. A couple of years to start getting complexity swamp over development teams. Wow. A smart guy like Eric Evans come up with, well, we need to change something. What about domain-driven design? But domain-driven design never really conquered, captured the heart of developers and architects. Because it doesn't work. <laughs> Simply. We have, we, have, we have to say that. It doesn't work. I mean, it could work, it's, oh, my, oh, my, oh baby, it could work, but it's not the answer. I don't think it's the answer. So we need to focus also on modeling, which is the answer to face complexity, but modeling how? Okay, step by step. What are the tools that as developers and architects we have today? So what, what are the tools, what, what we find in the tool chest that we open up and take things out to start doing our job? We have a, a universal, a set of universal principles of software design. It's the same set that was formalized in the 70s. Summarizing, separation of concerns, object orientation and the principles, polymorphism, blah, blah, blah. Cohesion and coupling, nothing new. But uh, we probably never used these tools in the most appropriate way. And what can we do? Okay, these are the tools. What can we do, concretely? Yeah, no, I switched it back, yeah, that's right. So these are the tools. What can you do with these tools? With separation of concerns, that is the theoretical foundation for layers, everybody knows that layers, that's all about layers. When you have layers, once you have layers, you, you're halfway. But why layers? Because of separation of concerns. Object orientation means implementing classes that all together form a model of some sort. Cohesion and coupling are the foundation for uh, code 
that once written is clean, is readable, is uh, conform to standards, but not necessarily ISO standards or international standards, just company standards or even developer <laughs> standards, as long as whatever is written is, uh, does the same things in the same way across the code base. Personally, again, I'm sorry if I bring my personal anecdotes in, but uh, I've never been the guy who wrote a millions lines of code a year. I mostly wrote million lines of text in Word, in articles and books. But uh, lately, I embraced uh, the Wurfall project. The Wurfall project is uh, essentially a relatively simple API, cross-language, built on top of a database managed by a company, so a commercial database. OK, let, let's call it a database, but it's not physically a, a database like SQL Server or whatever. What is the info stored in the Wurfall database? Device information. So you can think of the Wurfall database as a sort of big dictionary with a user agent strings being the key and uh, on the column of the dictionary a long list of capabilities, so value, name, value, name, value, name, value, about uh, five or six hundred capabilities for each device. So the idea is give me a user agent string and I will return you up to six hundred things that this user, the device running this user agent is known to be able to do. Now, this database is uh, used by Akamai, Google, and Facebook. So this is the, the library behind the mobile sites of Google, Facebook, and Akamai, but this, these are just the three biggest customers. So whenever you access the mobile site of Facebook or Google on any device, you probably have noticed that you have a different experience. That is an experience driven by the back end of Google and, and Facebook contacting and working with the Wurfall library. I am one of the guys who is behind this library. Personally, I'm taking care of the .NET, ASP.NET API of Wurfall. But Wurfall is, and that's the point, available for Java, for Ruby, for PHP, for C++. And when I joined two years ago the group, they gave me the Java code base and asked me to, they also gave me a .NET pre-draft and they asked me to make the two things match. I have a talk tomorrow on code readability that was just inspired by this experience. So how I navigated within the Java code base I received to understand key things. I mean, and for me, the logic of navigating into this database was completely new. OK, you have source code, source code that works. Yes, but written fairly badly. In fact, they fired the Java developers. They hired, they, they moved the project onto a, a different software house. So now things are better. And what I learned, as silly and minimal as it seems, is that just uh, you know, checking, when you work with uh, hundreds and okay, thousands and thousands and thousands of lines of code and classes, simply finding uh, in string dot index of versus string dot contains makes a huge difference. Because contains means, okay, I'm checking whether a substring is contained within a string. Getting index of and checking whether the returnant index is greater than zero technically does the same thing. But mentally, it's, it's a different thing. It takes more time to realize what, what the developer is doing there. It's a lack of consistency. That is, this is a silly, stupid, minimal example of cleaner coding. Being aware of this. Do the same things always in the same way. Normalize in a way. You're coding much the same way you spend time or you've been told to spend time 
on normalizing relational tables. It's a matter of applying, in the right way, principles of software design. Layers. This is now a much better, more modern version of a layered system. We grew up with presentation business data. And uh, okay, this is an independent conference, so I feel free to share my thoughts. I still believe that in Microsoft, too many people still believe that it's still a time of presentation, business, and data. And in particular, too many tutorials around ASP.NET and MVC, for example, tend to completely ignore the application layer, which is key instead. So what I, what, I, what I see and what inspires me when I design or review architectures, presentation layer is more or less what you understand it to be. I mean, I will have something to say about the presentation layer, but yeah, it's more or less, it does more or less what you expect it, it would be doing. The application layer is kind of gray. What's, what really goes there? The application logic. And what is the application logic? It's the logic of the particular application. So it's uh, the workflow, the workflows behind the use cases. OK, what's the use case? Oh, I, I heard this. OK, UML. Nobody is using today UML. OK, right. But the concept use case coming from UML still makes a lot of sense. The, you, the use case diagram was expected to describe an interaction between uh, the system and uh, an actor. The actor is the user, typically the user. So the application layer is where you find the implementation of the application logic, so the use cases. And we can translate the use case idea with a screen. You have a screen. For each screen you are going to display to the user, you have a use case. There's an interaction between the user and the system. This interaction requires a workflow. A workflow is a collection of ifs, switch, logic, simple logic, orchestration logic. That goes into the application layer. Simply that, just orchestration. And, yes, but. I have uh, my system, let's say a web system, and then I have uh, a native iPad application talking to the same back end. Okay, the two app are two different applications using, if that is the case, two different application layers. If you can use just one, fine. But it's not written anywhere that the iPad needs to have the same use cases as desktop website, the same set of screens. Or even when the screen is expected to do the same kind of tasks, like the login screen, it may be that on the iPad you have different controls, which, require a slightly di which produce a slightly different flow of data going in and out. So each application, each front end you build for each screen has an application layer. Infrastructure. Today, this can take nearly any form. Once, it was simply a relational database. Today, it can still be a relational database, maybe with some caching, in-memory caching on top of it, memcached, and cache, scale out, uh, Azure uh, something. Just caching to increase and better support scalability. Or it can be a combination of relational and non-relational, no SQL. It can be no SQL only. It can be everything. The most interesting uh, things happen in the domain layer. The domain layer is a, a layer highly inspired by domain-driven design. So domain-driven design came up in the early 2000s as a way to fight, so to speak, the rigidity of the relational model. So they say, well, try to be conceptual in your understanding of the system. 
reason in terms of objects, entities, and relationships. Try to give objects, you, your entities, data and behavior. And uh, then, at some point, to persist these objects, you use, you make the jump from the object level to the relational level, or whatever, using an ORM, entity framework, an hibernate, these kind of things. Or if you agree to use no SQL, just persist the object, the graph, directly to disk. But domain layer, OK, library of objects, classes. Classes representing entities in the business domain, customer, invoice, order, order details. But, uh, OK, data, fine. ID, date, items, customer name, address, data. And behavior. OK, what, kind, what is the behavior you expect in a domain library? Maybe the logic that reads or writes the record to the DB? No. The behavior in a domain is essentially behavior, logical behavior. For example, speaking of an invoice, it is the logic that calculates the estimated day of payment of an invoice, given the date of the invoice and the payment code, NAT30. And maybe, maybe, maybe this logic can take the date out the 30 days and maybe calculates holidays or special you know, dates in, in the time and gives you back a date that gives you an, a calculation of the estimated day of payment. It's logic, but it uses the data in the, li in the domain library to express itself. It has nothing to do with I.O. It has nothing to do with external services. In the domain layer, you find essentially two blocks. The domain logic, the DLL of classes, right? And the domain services, because at some point, you need some code that reads data from the infrastructure and hydrates those values into an instance of a domain object and back. Or you need logic that connects to external services to order, to, to place tasks and commands, get data, and then populate the domain for the domain to perform validation, calculation, whatever is expected and due to the domain logic. This is, these are the two elements you typically find in the domain layer. What about the presentation now? Well, the presentation is where you collect input and where you display output. But the evil is in the detail. OK, step by step, infrastructure. Today is essentially four options, cloud storage, no SQL, distributed storage, or in-memory storage, any combination of this. Now, what is the application layer? You can take this from the Eric Evans Domain Driven Design book. This is probably the best definition ever I can find for the application layer. Defines the jobs the software is supposed to do and directs the expressive domain objects in the domain layer to work out problems. Does not contain business rules or knowledge. It only coordinates tasks and delegates work to collaboration of domain objects in the next layer down. Do not, it does not have state reflecting the business situation. It's business agnostic, in a way. But it can have, optionally, state that reflects the progress of a task for the user or the program. Translated from the UI, you need to have uh, an endpoint to call. Okay? Think of a, the typical stupid button click event on a web forms or index method on a controller class. You are within the controller. The controller is, or, or the code behind, which are the same thing actually, is uh, still part of the presentation layer. From there, you need to call into the application layer, into an object in possibly a separated library or conceptually a separated entity that does the job. When we talk about, uh, in ASP.NET MVC, for example, I want my, 
I need my controllers, or ideally, controllers should be thin. No stop fat controllers. What does it mean? This. Take out code from the controller and make this code into some, into what, into where? This is where Microsoft fails, Microsoft evangelists fail, into an application layer. And then they still have to explain me why they spent resources on making the controller testable. You don't need to test the controller, actually. <laughs> There's no strict need. You want to test the application logic. That is, and this is a plain class with no dependencies at all. Needs to get something stored in session. Okay, the controller gets session and passes data. Data is injected in the, in the classes of the application layer. I mean, sounds like a maybe no big deal, very simple change, but it has a dramatic impact on the quality and readability and effectiveness of solutions. So where are we? On the layers now, we have a sort of fixed what we can expect to find in the infrastructure at the bottom. We have workflows in the application layer. We still don't want to have a direct connection between presentation and infrastructure, no data binding this way. And we still have gray areas to be explained in a few moments, what we find in the domain layer and what we find in the presentation layer. Now, where do we start from when it comes to building the system? Up until uh, a year ago, I would have said from the domain. Because the domain is, the, is where the most interesting things happen. It's where you define the actual behavior. You define the, the, the framework, the API of the system, regardless of how many front ends you end up building on top of that. But then I run into this popular picture. How users see programmers and how programmers see the user. We need to change our perspective of software. It is no longer a favor we do, we make to boring users, but instead, unfortunately for all of us, the software of the future to have a, a chance to be successful has to be a commercial product to attract users. So it's all about the experience we provide users with. User experience, first of all, the Copernican revolution of software architecture. And this is another popular picture you find nearly everywhere on the internet. This is what, uh, this is what the, the customer really needs. This is uh, how the marketing made it look like. So we, we can build this for you. And this is what the customer actually pay for. This is what he gets. Stop this. Do yourself a favor, stop this. By the way, if you know how also how to stop this, let me know. Okay. So, double, okay, what we do concretely, let me introduce you to a new term, double track analysis, which is uh, just a double track, no? so it's a parallel effort in which on one track we have the classic round of interviews to collect business data and build the domain layer, what we do usually. One track. Second track, second round of interviews to collect UX data and build the presentation layer. This is new. So it's about talking to the same people but asking different questions. And it's a, a second professional figure because the software architect takes care of this. It's another professional figure. I mean, professional figure doesn't mean necessarily a different person. But it's just, just a, a professional playing a different role. 
Now, in movies, usually you have one actor, one role. But there have been movies in which the same actor actually played two roles. So this is, can easily be the case here. So I'm not saying that you have to spend more money to hire new people, as long as, but you have to spend money or in some way improve yourself to get a separate additional set of skills. Step one, no, two actually, three steps, but anyway. Uh, concretely, the idea is start from building UI forms and make sure that these UI forms are just matching the user's expectation. Start defining workflows from there. And then connect workflows to existing biz logic. Okay, the strategy is nothing, you know, probably, oh wow. It's all, all here? Yes, it's all here. But try, make this work. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you know, my failure stories <laughs> came from. Because, yeah, easy, but hard to adopt. Lovely use screens. OK, uh, apparently, I, I could expect uh, an objection on the point one here uh, and, and the entire strategy here. Uh, maybe, Dino, are you talking about us going back to something called the waterfall model <coughs> methodology? You don't do anything until the UI is, the, 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 the screens of the UI are defined. So we lose in parallelism. We, are, we want to be agile. We want to iterate. You are saying that, you know, we have to, we have, you, are you hinting at that we stop and, and, and don't do any work until we have the UI screens and mockups approved? This is a, it's a tough question, right? Yeah, it's really tough. It's a great question, great point. Yes, I say you have to stop. <laughs> uh, I'm not completely convinced, but uh, if I have to give you an answer which is not in the pants, which is, which is, which is no answer at all, I would say yes, it's preferable. If you need a procedure, I would say stop. It will cost you something, probably yes. But if you really manage to move to step two, once step one is fixed, nothing else is at risk past that point. So the, the most critical part is defining how the user has to work with the screens. At the end of step one, you know exactly for each screen, for each use case, for each features that you invoice at the end of the project, it's clear, written in stone, countersigned, what comes in and what comes out of the screen. So easy at that point. The next step is just doing development work, building workflows. You know that you get this and you have to produce that. And in between the input and the output, it's entirely up to you. No need to interact with designers and anybody else. And if point one is successful, no need to quarrel, fight, with users for acceptance tests. It's exactly what you want. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I want another button. Okay, you approve this, this UI. Don't want this? Okay, there's more to do. Discuss and increase the budget. You have arguments at least to raise this point. Concrete, serious arguments, right? Uh, one of the reasons why, in my opinion, software projects often run out of budget is that we hardly speak, developers and customers, hardly speak 
with the management in the middle, we hardly speak the same language. And this is a concept that Eric, e Eric Evans tried to address in his domain-driven methodology with ubiquitous language. I mean, I would say that the point one here is all about defining a sort of ubiquitous language, except that it doesn't affect directly the shape and mechanics of the domain model, but it's stopped, it's limited at some graphical mockups, much simpler and much faster to create. And much more, much easier for the user to approve or not. You cannot go to a user and show the graph of objects you're going to create. Is this what you want? Yes, fine. This is the idea. Now, how would you ensure, in my opinion, that point one, which is critical, works? Okay, you, you, you need some uh, solid UI expertise, which is not what typically developers have. And this is, a, for management, is a key point to understand. Okay? This is one of the key points for, in my failure horror story. Have the people who, have, who holds the string, the, the poor strings, understand this key point. So the point is getting approved, get, having a, an approved design before real work except prototyping starts. And the focus has to be, however, not much on the colors, on the graphics, on the flat corners, but on the data flow. So when I, what, what I call solid UI design, yeah, has an, re requires a designer skills in the sense that, you know, I expect that the people who plans a UI has some idea of ergonomy, of usability. But here, the point is not much the choice of colors, or the form of corners, whether it has to be flat, gradients, it's not about that. It's about the flow of data. It's about how you make the process, the use case, work with the user. So sometimes uh, we have that bottlenecks in the way in which the user works with the system are originated. Maybe the, the, the form in itself is perfect, but maybe the form only allows to work, say, one record at a time. But for the user, it would be much easier and faster to work with multiple records at the same time. So it could be that the, the form is designed perfectly, but the, the use case needs to be refined. So we need that's why the value of the second track analysis, the second step in the double track analysis. So having people, having a new professional capable of understanding, observing users, working with prototypes, to observe, to film them. This is what these professionals actually do sometimes, just they film users. The time it takes, and then they interview continuously. They show videos to users. <coughs> They observe the reaction, the frustration, or the happiness of users. This is key. Tools for this. In general, this is called wireframing. If I have to, pick up, if I have to indicate a name for this methodology, it's sort of wireframing. Uh, here, uh, you, you find on this slide a uh, URL to a course. I think it's free from Tuts Plus, uh, a beginner's guide to wireframing. Essentially, wireframing consists in building the right, the optimized hierarchy of information in each screen. How users are expected to process information, which information they receive, which information they produce, how the information is represented at a given point. And a given point means in each screen. And if the screen is a wizard, put each steps in the wizard. 
So you, you, the, the more you can go here into details, the better. It saves you work for later. This is the, 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 the ROI, the return on this investment. And then get expert help. So let developers do development and uh, maybe pay developers less, but save some money, okay, to hire, to hire new people or to involve external consultants, charge customers more. So I'm not talking about getting the nicest HTML template. I'm not talking about, oh, a responsive template. I'm just talking about, I'm not talking about hiring a plain web designer. I'm talking about a much more significant professional figure. The name for this professional figure is, there's no name, UX architect is probably the best name we can find. And there's another URL here. Uh, it's really an interesting uh, perspective of a guy who actually was uh, asking and trying to find answers more or less to the same questions that I'm raising and trying to answer in the stock. I invite you to read this open letter to the design community. He essentially pleads the cause of UX architects and he raises the need of this kind of professional figure to be more frequent, to appear more frequently in uh, development. So it's uh, a position that mixes together analytics and creativity. So it must be able to analyze the system's behavior like a software architect, except that it's expected to produce mockups and process workflows instead of classes and layers and tiers and choosing technologies, what would do, what, we, what is instead the typical job of a software architect. Designing a user experience, if I have to summarize with a nice sentence. So job description could be, it does uh, usability reviews, uh, it defines the information architecture, defines the, the, it designs the interaction with users, and it also does, or reviews, the interface design. It's probably not responsible for choosing whether rounded corners or, or flat <laughs> you know, uh, fillers are better, but probably it can have a, a comment on uh, the position of buttons or maybe whether a list box is used or how scrolling takes place on which device. It is uh, ultimately responsible to help figure out what the product needs to be. It defines this kind of requirements. And here is uh, a few links uh, to a couple of tools, UX Spin and Balsamic, that are essentially smart drawing tools for quick prototyping. Um, in particular, Balsamic uh, is uh, yeah, it's just a uh, allows you to create forms and put on form, he has a, a list of widgets representing typical UI control, list box, buttons, scroll bars, and you, you take this and you put this, creating your visual experience, your, your, yeah, how it looks like, right? This is the first step, because depending on how critical the project can be, you can have some developers to build a prototype with fake data of that UI so that users can be filmed can test that, can give feedback uh, to the expert eyes, bottlenecks in the usability can be noted. Another interesting tool that I hopefully would be able to demonstrate right now is Wirefy, which is a, a bookmarklet. So a bookmarklet is uh, just a, a button that is attached to some browsers. I think I have a, one for Chrome. Um, and actually, uh, when you navigate to a website, when you are on a page, click this bookmarklet, and it gets you a graphical representation of the structure of the current web page. Uh, the free version I'm using now just uh, allows you to display that. If you get a license, you can export that structure to Balsamic, UXP, and other popular tools. To end the presentation, the horror story is uh, the company, I have a company 
and we do, we provide uh, software for uh, the tennis world, from clubs to professional tennis tournaments. And uh, we have uh, a product that we developed three years ago for booking tennis courts. And uh, three years ago, this product was cutting edge. It was the, at least we, looking at the Italian market, it was the first one. It was the, largely the, the best one, made to measure to tennis and whatever. Uh, then the, the company from small grew big, but making money from other type of revenues. So the business of selling products to clubs just was, put, was pushed aside. Three years later, the product is, needs to be redesigned. So we had customers complaining that the product misses the point of UX. There are better ways of doing the same things, okay, essentially. And this makes hard for us to sell the product. And to some extent, the product has, you know, uh, not doing certain improvements <coughs> make the entire product kind of pointless. So a complete redesign is uh, required. But this is a point that is very, for me, it's been very hard and disappointing <coughs> to sell to the, the, the guys that hold the purse's strings. And uh, I, I, I found, and this is the horror, paradoxical that um, I teach classes and I make any effort in telling people what, in my honest opinion, is the best way of doing things, and then I'm unable <laughs> to do the things my, myself in what I think the right way in my own company. That's up. And this was uh, just uh, the reason that forced me to present this talk here. And when I tried to explain, to, to, to run this same set of slides within the company, oh, right, fantastic, great idea, that's precisely what we want to do. No, they were fooling me. And uh, at the end, uh, yes, okay, but we get an HTML template. Uh, we do a little bit of you know, data binding, direct data binding to save data. Yes, All right, guys, you got exactly the point of what I said. Thank you. So that was the story, the horror story. So it's really, really, really hard to adopt in the real world. I hope you're luckier than me, but uh, this is why I started saying I have no success stories yet, at least. I can have failure stories, but on the other end, I'm truly convinced that if you, for each screen, can determine what comes in and out, and then you can create view model classes out of that, and then you can connect to an endpoint, which is simply the application layer, and make these classes return exactly what the UI expects. If you make the application layer orchestrate tasks, if you start with a top-down design, you have uh, fixed the application layer, and what remains is making sense of the domain layer. By the way, uh, speaking of the UI, uh, I mentioned this at the beginning of the talk, mobile versus device. There's one reason in my opinion, for uh, jumping on MVC 4 and 5 display modes, much more than Web API, display modes. Display modes are a little known feature of MVC 4, have a tremendous power, because it gives free the engine that automatically routes view depending on device. So if you combine together, I mean, uh, to set up display modes, you need to write one class, okay? And uh, define in an array context conditions. So just lambdas, plain lambdas. To recognize using Burfold or using any other framework, even your own logic, even your own sniffing of the user agent string, recognize the class of the device. Once you have done that, and you have created a condition, a condition like, is this a smartphone, is this tablet, is this desktop? Everything else happens for free. And all you have to do is adding index desktop CSHTML, index.tablet, index.smartphone, and so forth. 
free. So no excuse. MVC, SP, SP.NET MVC makes it so easy to support multiple devices, which is much, much, much more effective than responsive web design. It's the power of CSS versus the power of code. That's it. To finish off, domain layer. What is new here? Um, I mean, I've been fascinated by domain-driven design. Today, I recognize that domain-driven design in really complex domains is really complex to set up. And that's why people, the same fans, the same supporters of DDD started thinking of CQRS, Command Query Responsibility Segregation, which means essentially take the domain, instead of making the domain a big one, big thing, cut it, split it in two parts. A domain for read operations, for the data that comes to the UI, and one model completely distinct for the data that from the presentation goes down, commands against the system. So two smaller models, which is a much, much better idea. To the point that most of the time, the, domain, the domains you have in a CQRS scenarios are plain collection of DTO classes with no need of any complex logic in it. You keep on working like this, like, like, like today, right? But, you know, like we always did in the, before DDD, we organized ourselves with simple container, class containers. So with CQRS, you can keep on working like we do today, except that you introduce the application layer which nearly separates what is business and what is not business. Because business is not, is reusable across multiple front ends, application is not reusable, it's specific of each front end. But the new important thing that I invite you to reflect on is uh, event sourcing. Event sourcing is uh, based on this fact. In the world, there are events, not models. Models is what we, use, we humans use to try to represent I mean, weather forecasts, they built a mathematical model to try to understand what will be the weather of next week. But this is not typically what we need to do in software. We don't write software to forecast, to make forecasts, to forecast when the user is going to emit, issue an invoice, maybe when he pays the invoice, but that's a different story, okay? Uh, what we do in software is taking a note of an event being registered in the system. An order has been issued. An order has been updated. An invoice has been created, things like that. This has several benefits. We move from the last known good state to what is the sequence of events that characterize an entity. So there are quite a few new th things that must be added. I invite you to learn more on your own on event sourcing. I can give you points in, in case. But uh, event sourcing, so moving the design of the, 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 the overall architecture towards events instead of plain objects, and using objects only to move data around, well, that is definitely the master move, the key move to address and fight scalability at all levels. Because you make read and write completely asynchronous. In simple systems, you use the database to synchronize. I write and I read, I write and I read, and most of the 99% of the time, it's, you know, it's, like, it's asynchronous, but it works like it's synchronous because you know, there's the, 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 the distance between the read and the write is, even in real-time systems, is so small that it's nearly hard, nearly impossible to perceive. In more complex situations, by using service buses, you can eventually present to users consistent data. But I mean, there's a lot more to say about even sourcing architectures. This is not the place. But that is really a big change taking place in architecture. 
probably, in my honest opinion, as big as object orientation was 25 years ago. At the end of the day, UX from start, get expert help from UX architects, design data flow around events, and then from events, if that is critical for the responsiveness of your UI, create aggregates of data ready to use, cache data in, on the way, and you can still have uh, the events recorded, maybe to a relational database, but on the way back, if the architecture of the info in the UI is so complex that has graphics, uh, complex graphs, hierarchical stuff, why not using NoSQL to save a hierarchy ready to be displayed in the UI? And the event, the event, wow. The event, what is the event? Is a, okay, a code that identifies what has happened, up to you and then some data. But uh, what if at some point you need to add a new requirement? So the system now is implementing a new action, a new event. Okay, you just add a new class. How can I persist? How, do, do I need to modify the relational schema? No, you use no SQL. No SQL. I've never been a fan of no SQL, but this is really a scenario that is making no SQL, is giving no SQL a real reason to be considered. There are a lot of things to be assessed about no SQL. Performance, in first place, I mean, on large numbers. On average numbers is good. More importantly, from the perspective of CTOs and CIOs, ecosystem of tools, profiling, uh, SQL Server, you, you have debuggers, you have profilers, you have <laughs> everything. No SQL databases. You have a yeah, the, the studio to manage tables. Maybe you have a profiler. You know, you, you must really make sure that given the amount of work you're going to do on a no SQL database, you have the right tools for the job. But there are, the, I mean, I start seeing strong reasons business reasons to look into NoSQL. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for your time.